Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Good morning to those in the in the US. Uh, welcome to the EU TechBridge webinar, uh, East Coast, more specifically uh, Massachusetts and, and, and Boston. Um, my name is uh, Harald Bruns. I'm a business development manager at Water Alliance, a water technology cluster from the Netherlands. Um, we're happy to have you here today. Um, and Anna can give me the next slide. I'll walk through the agenda with you. Um, after my words, and I especially like to welcome, of course, our presenters uh, shortly, Dave West, Zinet Magavi, and Audrey Schumann, who will uh, who are our case owners and, and talk about their innovation needs. Um, we would like to ask you to put your questions uh, in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, and we, after every presentation, uh, we'll have time to go into uh, a Q&A with the presenter and us. Um, any questions or, or more detailed questions with regard to the EU TechBridge program, we are quite open-ended uh, in the end and can take time for that to, uh, to go into uh, detail with you. Um, have roughly one hour. Um, so would like to give the word now to Anna from the Sustainable Business Hub, who will introduce the EU TechBridge program. Thank you so much, Hero. Um, so my name is uh, Anna Tibelin. I'm the project manager of the EU TechBridge project. The aim of the project is to match European small and medium-sized enterprises with North American-based end users and corporates who are looking for innovative water and energy solutions. We are five European clusters as parts of the consortium. It's the Sustainable Business Hub in Sweden, the Clean Cluster in Denmark, Avaisen in Spain, Lombardy Energy Clean Tech Cluster in Italy, and Water Alliance in the Netherlands. And I'm very happy that all partners here are represented here today. We are working in missions. There will be approximately five missions we already have two ongoing, one to New York City and one to East Coast USA. And the one to one meetings are taking place right now for the New York City and the East Coast USA is where we are right now. We also have three upcoming missions, two in Canada and one more in the US. And these will take place in uh, fall and winter of 2021. Um, at the eutechbridge.eu webpage, you can follow the project and, and so you don't miss out on any of the missions. But first and foremost, can you apply for our fantastic opportunities? Well, anyone who is in a European SME can apply. We are looking for water and energy um, technology-based companies. And we do have the possibility to give a grant for travel expenses, which might raise uh, when you're part of, of the program. There are some limitations to who can receive uh, grants, but we welcome anyone to get in contact with us to see what your opportunities are. If you have any questions, you can always contact one of the local partners. This is the contact information. And of course, this information will be sent out to all of the participants afterwards. You may also contact the, the project email, which is info at eutechbridge.eu. So without any further ado, I would like to give the word back to you, Harold, to start with the technology needs introductions. I will only go in uh, very briefly in between and, and give time for, for Zineb to, uh, to share her presentation. Uh, Zineb works for HEAT. Um, she's, of course, best herself to tell what HEAT is all about. Uh, and I'm very excited because I think they are very interested in intermediary and connector within the Boston uh, Boston area, working on some interesting pilot projects, especially in the crossover of water energy because of uh, thermal uh, energy from uh, 
water and drinking water. Yeah, Zeynep, I would, uh, I'm happily giving the word to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna share screen and hopefully that will go smoothly. And there we go. All right. So yes, HEAT is a nonprofit. And our mission is to cut uh, emissions or solve climate change. Uh, we are specifically not funded by industry, including gas or geothermal. And that independence is essential to our efficacy and allows others to trust we are seeking the best solutions at all times. And so we are really excited to meet all of you and hear more about such solutions in Europe. So this is our gas infrastructure. It's a beautiful network and it was cutting edge in the 1800s. Now it is crumbling and leaking. And this is an image of methane leakage from Boston's gas pipe network. And yes, something does need to be done. And it does have something to do with water, I promise. But we're starting with gas. So we are actually doing something in Massachusetts. This map is the next five years of a 20 year uh, plan to replace the old gas pipe with new. Each button is a segment of pipe getting replaced. So last year, the utility estimated cost was $4.4 million a mile. So we are talking over $14 billion going into new gas infrastructure, which is amortized and paid off by customers over 40 years. But as you might've heard, our state and now our country has committed to cutting emissions in half by 2030. So this is not a good plan or a good way to spend that much money. So we need instead to triage our gas system to reduce risk and leakage while we move as quickly as possible to transition, investing in an energy system for the coming century, not the last. And the question is how? And before we get to how, I want to quickly point out that collapse is not an option. Too many people rely on our public utility for affordable heat. We cannot allow the market to drive creative destruction we need, yet we need rapid transformation. So we therefore propose a creative evolution. And each um, gas pipe that comes out from the distal ends of the system in, we propose replacing with uh, a networked geothermal or networked ground source heat pump technology uh, pictured here. Uh, it has, like the gas system, um, service lines going into each building where there's a ground source heat pump pulling temperature off the water, you were waiting for that, in the pipes. And uh, there are boreholes, uh, geothermal boreholes uh, attached going down a few hundred feet, not into the earth's core. And um, this technology, according to a feasibility study we completed in 2019, can deliver even on its own uh, all of the necessary heating and cooling to a majority of segments um, in the Massachusetts gas system. Um, I just really briefly and uh, want to clear confusion that geothermal is a word used for multiple technologies. And on the left, you have um, a central low temp geo source like the one in the uh, Clichy Batignon suburb of Paris. Uh, next in, you have something like you see in Iceland where you're actually going down to hot lava, which of course is very close there. Uh, what we are proposing is different. It's on the left. It is a district, but generation is distributed. It's bi-directional ambient temperature and provides simultaneous heating and cooling balanced in the design window of 40 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit through utility management. And brought to scale, we're calling this a geogrid. All right, so none of these components are new technology. Uh, each of them is work, works and the aggregation um, can deliver as promised, there are some case studies. Uh, one reason that we get great benefits out of this interconnection is there are two key efficiencies once you interconnect uh, ground source heat pump systems. Energy exchange, which means that synchronous cooling and heating loads cancel each other, reducing your total energy demand. In the picture, you have a supermarket that is cooling and thus rejecting heat into the system while the other uh, buildings are heating uh, and those simultaneous loads cancel. And then thanks to the energy storage capacity of a borehole array or B-test, we can also effectively cancel asynchronous cooling and heating loads, balancing the system over an annual basis by storing energy from season to season. 
So that leads to an impressive set of benefits. Uh, increased safety, lower energy bills, as shown in this uh, Applied Economics Clinic brief, uh, and an energy transition that keeps workers in jobs and includes everyone, not just those who can afford it. That impressive set of benefits has gotten a lot of folks engaged, but how would we take it from one segment to a full geogrid? Uh, first of all, these geo micro districts are designed to interconnect like Lego blocks. You would install one from the distal end in, back up the gas system, uh, iterate until you're left in the densest areas, potentially with a supplemental heat source like biogas or hydrogen at an appropriate scale. And that is how we would transform the gas utilities into thermal utilities. And again, thanks to that impressive set of benefits and the feasibility of this, um, we have a number of initial installations going in the ground. There are two that are approved and uh, moving forward in Massachusetts, uh, as well as one pending uh, filed at our Department of Public Utility. There is uh, one approved in New York, um, some money committed to exploring it in New York. And actually just last week, Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York City committed to uh, moving forward with a geothermal utility for this city. So there is just enormous movement and progress uh, very rapidly, thanks in part um, to a very, very broad change ecosystem as well. So I wanna share with you most importantly, the key challenges ahead. So first, that, that I see as relevant to this group. So the first is the thermal management. So it will be a new business for a gas utility and will require new tools. And particularly with the adaptive growth model, balancing the annual load will require creative approaches to shedding excess heating or cooling. Um, and I, I've pictured two here, <laughs> warming irrigation water and, uh, sorry, cooling irrigation water and warming um, sidewalks are two uh, methods of thermal management that have been used to date. Um, and then optimization, which uh, as the thermal grid grows, uh, new approaches and technologies will be needed to move towards an internet of energy and tap into the synergies between a thermal grid, uh, a water system and an electric power grid. Uh, but let's come to the most urgent and, and um, immediate need, which is to minimize the installation cost uh, and drive this technology forward. And I believe you can help with this because we have, we already have a network of water pipes in the streets of our communities. In other words, there is an opportunity here to integrate this new thermal utility idea with our existing water infrastructure using our water system within the range, uh, appropriate range, as a thermal source or sink. And uh, in, in Massachusetts and elsewhere, we, our water system also has some challenges and needs further investment to meet the needs of the next century. So this could be a, a real win-win, um, a source of revenue for our water departments and our municipalities um, by tapping into this resource while reducing the cost of moving to a thermal grid. Um, of course, there's also waste heat recapture technology that could be uh, very beneficial as well. So we're here to learn about available technologies in each of these categories. And you might wonder, what is HEAT's role? Uh, I will just briefly explain that we have, um, we, we, if we attempt to <laughs> convene people, resources, and ideas to drive forward the change that we need. And our, our monthly charrettes have a goal of open conversation and information sharing across all stakeholders to give you a sense of that. Um, this is one pictured uh, and e every month, um, gas utilities, participating customers, municipalities, workers, geo contractors, developers, advocates, regulators, scientists, and more come together. Um, there are no fistfights and we attempt to solve the challenges ahead. And uh, through this process, we're building a library of tools and making the materials publicly available online and all are welcome. We hope to host one in the fall on the water energy nexus and are seeking ideas and solutions to that. Uh, we also are building a resource library with the intent of providing an open platform for collective learning to best accelerate market transformation. And to do so requires deep understanding and good data from widely respected sources. So we have convened an all-star research team to deliver that. In summary, 
we believe that transforming our gas infrastructure into a water source system uh, or networked geosystem is the most efficient and equitable path beyond gas. And we are in learning mode, always, and want to hear from you about solutions, ideas, and opportunities. Because the world urgently needs <laughs> clean, safe, green energy for all with low customer bills and good jobs. So we have to take an all hands on deck approach, just as global vaccine scientists have shown us this past year. Together, we have a chance to reimagine our energy future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zeynep, for that uh, inspiring uh, and interesting, uh, yeah, on, on the on the the, the micro uh, the geo uh, districts that you're developing in in, in Boston. What I personally uh, have, have understood uh, from heat is that uh, especially your role you're, you're invited in many places yeah, because you are uh, yeah naturally the connector uh, within that uh, energy transfer uh, yes. period right it's it's a unique role uh, a little hard to explain we, we've found our way into it uh, yes we basically offer free uh, consulting and connection to all of the industry that are now um, beginning to drive this forward. Uh, and they appreciate that. Um, we stay independent um, in order to be most trusted by all stakeholders, to be able to convene that really broad range of people, which we believe drives change forward more rapidly. And I think there's also the interesting connection with the EU tech bridge that you can well position SMEs uh, applying, especially at the right spot within the whole Boston uh, uh, yeah, initiatives uh, that are taking place. Um, we have some questions coming in. I, I just throw them at you if you're okay with that. Um, so from, from uh, one is, is what, what kind of approvals is this is more for the, um, for the SMEs who have, might have some questions, of course, with regard to rules and regulations. What approvals are needed in the US to use groundwater and thermal energy in this way? Uh, is there an extensive permitting uh, required? <sighs> Yeah, so we are, are working um, with our Department of Environmental Protection um, and other ag relevant agencies. There, uh, as you might imagine, uh, are not yet an extensive regulations around this kind of technology and, and will need to be. Um, and so at the moment, uh, because it is a closed system, it is not consuming um, groundwater, uh, as I see in the question, um, but it's just thermal exchange. Uh, there is minimal permitting and um, I believe there actually should be more regulation than there is going forward. Uh, but I hope we can design it very reasonably. It is probably developed on the way. Here's also technical options uh, are, are available and, and, and need to be implemented sometimes for the first time, I, I, I guess yes. Uh, as well, yes. Um, and can I just add that, and I'm Audrey. Hi, <laughs> I'm Audrey. Audrey. <laughs> I just wanted to add in that uh, Toronto uh, uses the drinking water uh, that come, you know, from uh, to cool almost all the buildings downtown uh, throughout the summer, and that they've done this for decades, and it's uh, easy to do, and clearly the the U.S. can can follow along, and there's some there's a variety of different places where they're beginning to do this in the U.S. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, 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 another question uh, that, coming in that I see is the, um, are you only focusing on local geothermal sources or do you also look at aquathermal possibilities? Well, that, that is uh, have part of what we had discussed on forehand. It, uh, if, if I, yeah, please respond. Uh, yeah, so, um, so aqua for thermal energy systems or ATES, um, I believe they would be an excellent um, solution to add when we get to a certain um, uh, size for this geogrid, because uh, there has to there's a scale question. So um, once we've scaled to a certain number of customers and and usage, then an aquifer thermal energy system would be an excellent way to tap into that energy storage and pot potentially even benefit the electric grid by um, using thermal energy storage. Uh, however. We are actually using borehole thermal energy storage, BTES, um, in this initial growth pattern because it, it's localized and small, segment by segment. It's building the, the geogrid from the bottom up. Um, and there are, of course, an endless number of other thermal energy sources and sinks all around us when we begin to think that way. 
Then that, posing that, of course, you and following on on the questions that that came in, uh, then you, of course, uh, balancing is key, right? Uh, the balance in the energy yes. consumption is key uh, to use also the energy source, which and most optimally uh, at different periods within the year, of course. Yeah. Uh, I guess you also refer to that a little bit with your Internet of Things, uh, uh, where you also referring yes. to. That's probably part of that energy balancing. Uh, but how is this arranged? What is your vision on it? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I can't profess to have a clear vision on it yet because that's quite in, in the future. Uh, but I, I do see a lot of opportunity that um, if we begin to think in systems and have build a thermal grid, uh, we can then use that thermal grid as a source and sink at multiple scales. Uh, so even, you know, the, the idea of using your water heater as a localized short-term energy storage um, has been out there as part of the Internet of Energy. Uh, and then you scale that to the, the ATES that people mentioned at a, at a, at a system size. An ATES can serve the same purpose. Um, and so uh, if we are able to optimize between systems, for example, uh, wind energy at night that is not uh, getting used could be dumped into thermal energy storage to be used later in the year at peak heating load. Right. The can you say something about the yeah the incentive? Let me call it the incentive system um, because uh, you are yourself are not from not nonprofit, but you're working of course with for profit organization or with government. Yes. Um, so there's a role in there, but but also how is this yeah. yeah. Or, or what are the drivers for, for those other stakeholders to invest together with you yeah. in this infrastructure? So there are two key drivers. We're, we're, we have uh, targeted the gas utilities as, as the key um, mechanism to drive this technology forward uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, they have the rights of way. Um, however, um, integrating them with the water utilities, I think would probably be the optimal path forward. For the gas utilities, they are facing an existential crisis. They do not have a future at the moment. And looking at hydrogen and biogas and the costs of that, um, this option it allows them a uh, higher upfront infrastructure cost, which of course fits well with their business model, um, and a lower energy cost for the consumer. So it ends up being a very attractive business model, which is part of why we've seen the gas utilities move very quickly. Uh, forward. Uh, they aren't typically known for rapid innovation, uh, mm -hmm. but what we're seeing is quite different. And the, the, the calculations that you can show them uh, do show the, the potential, especially uh, in, on, on the, uh, yeah, where you are uh, with slightly cold winters and uh, even hotter summers coming up, uh, same as here in the northern uh, part of Europe. Absolutely. We, we, we ran a feasibility study with Bureau Happold Engineering um, it should, and I will mention that the, the utilities that have filed also ran their own cost calculations, of course. Um, across the board, it's coming out approximately 60% higher infrastructure cost going in. And remember, a gas utility makes its profit off of assets in the ground. Uh, and then <clears throat> because of removal of the price of fuel, uh, the customer pays less for their heating and adds mm -hmm. cooling. Uh, so the net, um, I think the, uh, the, the loser in the equation is the fracking fields, perhaps. I have to pick a little bit on the questions that are coming in, uh, Zeynep, and I see also Suliet Audrey would like to yes. uh, respond yes. to a question. Let me go back to that specific one, uh, Audrey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, I clicked on the wrong button, I think, but I'm happy to answer the question. I, I thought the tool was a nice one. I thought Audrey's <laughs> pretty skilled in, in the Zoom environment. But you could <laughs> it's hard in the early morning to, you know, without enough coffee to click the right button. But, but um, if you pick so, up that question, Audrey, please be my guest. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, there is district energy. The question was, is, isn't there district energy in Cambridge and Boston? And there is, uh, but is, it is a steam system done by uh, the company called Vicinity. Um, and steam would be hard to, you know, because we're talking about ambient temperature, uh, you know, gr you know, uh, boreholes, et cetera. So this, this system, which would be water-based would be very hard to retrofit into an existing steam system. And again, as Zeynep has already said, our hope is to work with the gas 
uh, utilities to do this uh, as one of the primary drivers, because then we can equitably meet everybody's needs uh, and avoid the stranded assets possibility. And, uh, you know, where the entire system would come down on the people who could least afford to buy a new heating system, that would be disastrous. So that's uh, why we want to work with the gas utilities on this. And vicinity, of course, would also be great to work with, but it might, like I said, be hard to, to retrofit, as the gas system will be also. <laughs> And uh, that gave me a chance to read some of the great questions. So um, on the question, who's going to pay for the infrastructure to be built? Uh, so as, you, as I mentioned in the very beginning, there's already uh, over $14 billion allocated for gas pipe replacement. Our, our first step um, in Massachusetts was to get a law passed uh, permitting gas utilities to do these installations. And our second step is to um, redirect that entire fund to driving forward the geogrid. Um, that is not dissimilar in other states. There is aging infrastructure in all of our older cities in the same way. And uh, the, of course, the, the people who actually are paying for the infrastructure are the rate payers or those who uh, pay their utility bills. Um, but it's amortized over, over 40 to 60 years, depending on the state. I guess even with, with 1%, you could already do a lot. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, we, we're a little bit out of time. I propose that we share the questions with you uh, and it's, it's written who's asking them so we can retract them and, and share them with you uh, in any way. Maybe we still have some time also at the end um, of, the, of the, the webinar today. Um, maybe talking a little bit for you, but I think in, in general, you're quite interested also to be connected in, yeah, broadly with, with Europe uh, and not yes. only on what a a typical technology supplier, but could also be an engineering company uh, or even give, give you an update on uh, rules and regulations or uh, laws and regulations within Europe uh, dealing with the topic. Uh, so you're, you're in that sense interested in a broad exchange uh, with, with European counterparts. Huh? That's, uh, is Absolutely. And uh, you guys are a wee bit ahead of us on some things. <laughs> and, well, we and the challenge is uh, to make one and one make three, right? To that mm. uh, joint efforts are, are are larger than the sum of the parts. Now, I want to thank you for uh, for your time. Um, if you can stick around, please, till the end. Maybe we can still do a round of some of the questions. But then I would like to slowly like to invite uh, Dave uh, Dwest from the MWRA to to join us. And uh, I already see he's he's going live, uh, sitting in front of the god of the pot of gold again. I see. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, Dave, I, I best uh, give the floor to you to, uh, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Deer Island uh, sewage shipment plant and uh, what you do there and what kind of innovation needs you see at the, uh, at the sewage works that you're, you're dealing with. All right. Thank you, Harold. I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me. All right, so I'm assuming that everyone can see that. Perfect, uh, Dave. I'll... All right, so uh, my topic, uh, so uh, I, my name is Dave Duest. I'm the Director of Wastewater Treatment for the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority's Deer Island Treatment Plant. Uh, I focus mostly on the sewerage side of the business. Uh, who is MWRA? But MWRA is a quasi-state public agency uh, that represents our service district. Uh, we provide wholesale water and sewer services to 2.5, actually, that's closer to 3 million customers in 61 communities now, 34% of the population of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, so that's a shot of Massachusetts with all the uh, highlighted communities. Uh, the ones that are on the further west uh, in this area right in here are actually water-only customers in the Chicopee Valley. Uh, we actually have uh, our main water supply is in the Quabbin Reservoir, which is in the central part of the state. Uh, and uh, they get water service directly from that Quabbin Reservoir, but most everybody gets it from uh, 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 the Quabbin Reservoir goes to the Wachusett Reservoir, which then goes to a water treatment plant and then uh, to the rest of the service district. So on the water side, we provide about 200 million gallons of uh, drinking water every single day to our customers. Uh, there's about 51 communities of those 61. Uh, and on the sewer side, there's 43 communities, uh, 2.3 million people uh, that provide uh, about 360 million gallons per day 
uh, with peak flows up to 1.3 billion gallons per day. And you can see the highlighted area where I'm located, which is the Red Star, uh, which is the Deer Island treatment plant located at the heart of uh, Boston Harbor, uh, further uh, east of our service district. So what is the Deer Island treatment plant? But uh, it's a result of a $3.8 billion construction uh, uh, project that spanned from 1985 till 2001. Uh, parts of the facility came online in 1995 and then uh, it was complete in 2001. Uh, it is the second largest wastewater treatment plant in the United States, with the Detroit being the largest. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, a design average flow of about 360 million gallons per day, uh, with peak flows up to 1.3 billion gallons per day. Uh, we have a biological treatment process uh, to comply with the Clean Water Act, and that's uh, secondary treatment. Uh, that actually has peak capacities to 700 million gallons per day. Uh, you can tell uh, from the uh, site and the picture uh, that we're pretty much constrained by the island that we're located on. Uh, it's, a, it's not an island per se, because it's actually con connected to the mainland through the town of Winthrop. Uh, but uh, that adds additional challenges getting materials to and from the island for, uh, for, tr uh, for treatment purposes. Uh, you can see our uh, uh, notable egg-shaped digesters. Uh, we're one of the largest egg-shaped digester installations in all of the United States, uh, and we rival a lot of the German uh, uh, facilities as well. Uh, and uh, But we are built sustainably on 210 acres, about 160 acres inside the security perimeter, uh, with 60 acres of uh, public access around the entire island. You can actually come out park at the head of the island and walk 2.6 miles around the entire perimeter, uh, get great views of Boston uh, and uh, Massachusetts Bay. Uh, we are one of the ultimate recycling facilities. We clean the wastewater, get it 94% uh, pure. Uh, we do discharge to um, uh, Massachusetts Bay, so it goes back to the water cycle that way. Uh, but all of the solids removal from the wastewater treatment process are anaerobically digested in those egg-shaped digesters. Uh, we produce 22% uh, uh, of, the, of the electricity needs of the plant with the uh, beneficial biogas that's created from that process and uh, greater than 95% of the heat needs of the plant. So we see a benefit of between 16 and $26 million US dollars uh, every single year as a result of that process. Any remaining residuals that cannot be broken down in those anaerobic digesters are converted to a fertilizer pellet and then marketed as a fertilizer. We do use a, a, a unique uh, combination of space space saving technology, vortex grit chambers to get rid of any sand and uh, other material that might flush down uh, the sewer system. Uh, we have stacked uh, primary and secondary clarifiers. So uh, we try to take advantage of the surface area by stacking these clarifiers one on top of each other uh, and then common wall construction. We use pure oxygen in our biological second, secondary treatment process. Uh, in the disinfection and dechlorination area, we use a portion of the outfall uh, as our contact basin. Uh, Deer Island is unique in that the discharge point for the treatment plant is actually nine and a half miles out in Massachusetts Bay uh, and 110 feet of sea, uh, of, uh, sea water. Uh, so we try to use a portion of that outfall, which is about 22 and a half feet in diameter uh, it's, uh, and holds about 160 million gallons. So it gets about 10 hours worth of contact time in that basin or in that, um, uh, that tunnel system. So obviously we try to take advantage of that construction and use it as a portion of our uh, contact basin. Uh, I mentioned we already have egg shaped digesters. So we use height rather than width. Uh, uh, traditional digesters are more pancake style, they're flatter. Uh, so they might be only 30 feet tall. Our digesters would not end up being 300 feet wide. Uh, the egg-shaped digesters are only 90 feet wide, but they're 140 feet tall. Uh, and then we have green energy throughout. So we use uh, we actually have hydroelectric turbines uh, installed in our um, the uh, effluent end of our disinfection basin uh, in the uh, drop shaft going to the outfall tunnel. Uh, so we recapture between 25 and 40 feet of, uh, of uh, water drop uh, through that hydro turbine. Uh, that gets us about 6 million kilowatt hours annually for electricity. 
Uh, we also have two conventional open bladed turbines uh, and a number of different solar uh, installations as well. Right now about 750 kilowatts, uh, but we're talking about increasing that by another two megawatts uh, potentially. So we are sustainably designed. Uh, we, were, uh, we were one of the first facilities in the United States uh, to plan for sea level rise, two and a half feet of sea level rise, uh, plus a hundred uh, year storm event direct hit. Obviously we're right in the middle of uh, Boston Harbor at the mouth of the harbor. Uh, and God forbid there was ever a large storm event with a large uh, 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 run up. Uh, but we are designed specifically for that. Uh, and you can see uh, this is an inundation map that shows with a hundred year storm event and two and a half feet of sea level rise, what parts of the facility would actually go under. So a pier would go under, but the rest of the treatment works would actually stay uh, protected. So challenges that the MWR and Deer Island face. Uh, COVID, I'm not gonna get into that because uh, hopefully we're on the tail end of that. Uh, we're all looking forward to uh, getting back to somewhat normal uh, conditions at some point. Uh, we are um, a coastal facility, so climate change and sea level rise is important. As I mentioned, Deer Island uh, is already taken care of from that perspective, but we can always improve our operation. Uh, we are a critical infrastructure, uh, so homeland security, phys uh, uh, physical and cybersecurity are always important issues. Um, I'll talk about the highlighted uh, ones, the coastal facility and the energy uh, a little bit more later, uh, but these other ones I'm just going to touch upon here. Uh, on the energy side, uh, we always want to be less reliant on fossil fuels and getting off the grid. Uh, currently, Deer Island is about 65% off the grid in total between heat and electricity. Uh, and we're actually looking at a potential for changing our combined heat and power process and bringing that up to 85, 90% off the grid, which would be amazing for a second largest treatment plant in the country. Uh, from a process perspective, we have a number of complications as part of wastewater treatment. Struvite uh, is uh, like a scale uh, and piping systems that are associated with wastewater treatment, uh, especially in anaerobic digestion. Uh, anything to prevent or mitigate uh, struvite formation is important. Right now, we buy about 2 million pounds of iron uh, in the form of iron salts every single year. Uh, and that has a tendency to get very expensive uh, and also comes with a lot of different trucks uh, that come to the Deer, uh, Deer Island treatment plant, about 400 trucks a year uh, to deliver that chemical. So obviously anything that we can do to uh, change that around and find alternatives is an important thing. Uh, nutrients, nutrients are always an issue at any wastewater treatment plant on their discharges. Uh, currently Deer Island is not regulated for nutrients, uh, but we are, we are anticipating nutrient discharge uh, limits uh, in the future. So nitrogen and phosphorus and the effluent. Uh, we are currently regulated on the, uh, our phosphorus limits in, within our pellets, uh, and that does impact our land application for the fertilizers that we create. Uh, and then we have a number of emerging uh, contaminants that are obviously um, impacting most wastewater treatment plants, both uh, in the United States as well as internationally as well. Uh, and that includes PFAS, also known as uh, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, there's a mouthful. Uh, so uh, those are ubiquitous in the environment. They've been uh, manufactured for 40, 50 years. It's about 40,000 chemicals. Uh, they have a tendency to degrade to some of the more toxic forms. Uh, and there's a concern to regulate these in the drinking water level down to 20 parts per trillion, which is amazingly low in concentration. Uh, it also will be impacting uh, contaminant levels uh, within the biosolids, but these are currently not regulated uh, currently in the biosolids, but um, they, they are looking at it very intently and we are anticipating new regulations very shortly. Uh, endocr endocrine disruptors uh, and also pharmaceuticals, those are all, always of concern. Uh, they do have a tendency to get in the effluent. They also have a tendency to get into the biosolids. Uh, and that can uh, impact uh, both our discharge permit as well as the marketability of our biosolids. So a little bit more information on some of these uh, critical infrastructure, coastal facility. Um, climate change is real. Uh, we have seen some unusual flooding. This is actually shot uh, in the Charlestown Navy Yard. 
Um, actually, no, this is, uh, sorry, this is State Street in Boston uh, from a storm that occurred in March of 2018. And you can see uh, the level of unprecedented flooding uh, within uh, the city. Uh, here's a shot in Winthrop, that same storm event, uh, where uh, a lot of the town, which is also obviously a coastal town, also went underwater as well, kind of validating those earlier images that I was showing on the, um, uh, the inundation map that we were seeing. So uh, while I mentioned that Deer Island isn't uh, necessarily, is fairly well prepared because we actually designed uh, for uh, the 100 year storm event plus sea level rise, uh, but you can see all the other facilities that are in MWRA's district, uh, mostly on the sewer side that are coastal and that are of concern for potential flooding. So in the short term, uh, uh, any of these at-risk buildings are being fitted with temporary flood barriers. But in the long term, every time we do a major retrofit about on a 20-year cycle, uh, we bring those uh, up in elevation, uh, literally building everything up uh, and to get it out of the floodplain. I, me I mentioned combined heat and power and, uh, and energy. Uh, this kind of shows you where we're at. Uh, from the electricity perspective, 65% of our electricity is still purchased uh, externally. Um, and this isn't showing our uh, heat side, but uh, right now we're getting about greater than 95% of our heat needs of the plant. All in all, that brings us up to about 64% of all, all of Deer Island's heat needs are met by digester gas alone. Then you throw in the other green energy sources that we have, and that brings it up over 65%. So this is a little shot of uh, renewable energy and MWRA, our anaerobic digesters. Uh, so you can see from the uh, picture that's in my background um, with the rainbow ending at the digesters, we like to call that our own pot of gold on Deer Island uh, because that does uh, provide an awful lot of energy savings and cost savings annually. Uh, but more importantly, we use wind turbines uh, and hydro turbines around all the different facilities at MWRA. Uh, some of the other future energy e efforts that we're doing, I mentioned the CHP changes, which is combined heat and power. But more importantly, uh, we're also looking at expanding our solar systems on Deer Island. Uh, we've issued a purchase power agreement to add another 1.2 megawatts of uh, canopy uh, installation uh, over some of our major parking lots uh, on the island. Uh, and that will bump it up to a, over two megawatts in total. So with that, uh, I want to open it up for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dave, uh, for that intriguing uh, presentation. Some, some of the numbers are, uh, are impressive. One of the questions that actually came in, uh, a follow-up question on what you've shared so far, uh, what would be the cost of those 2 million pounds of iron salts? Um, don't know if that information is that you can share with us, but uh, it, it, yeah, it, it is a, a, a big amount of iron salts that you bring into the plant. So that's for sure. Yeah, so right. Uh, so uh, just five years ago, we were paying as low as 35 cents a pound of iron. Uh, so that so essentially that two million pounds was what somewhere in the order of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, but over the last uh, five years, uh, the costs have increased. Uh, dramatically, uh, coupled with a lot of pressures on uh, getting uh, truck drivers. <laughs> uh, it's not just the raw, sort, uh, raw resources that are the, uh, uh, that are the issue. Um, there's a cheap version of uh, ferric uh, or iron salts uh, that's a byproduct of the steel manufacturing industry. And, uh, and that uh, construction industry has kind of dropped dramatically. Uh, so we have to rely on more of a manufactured product. So right now we're paying almost a dollar a pound. So we've seen a tripling in that cost. So we're paying about $2 million annually in, uh, in iron salts. Yeah, that, that is indeed uh, a lot of money allowing you also yeah, to look at alternatives in that sense. So that, that would be interesting to hear uh, what, uh, yeah, but also from, from the European perspective uh, can, can be looked at. I'll, I'll share some of the questions that come into the, uh, the Q&A box with you, uh, Dave. Yeah, any insight in removal of medicine residuals? Um, 
yeah, I, I realize this more often that there's a, a slight difference between the, also the um, the words, of course, that are used in the USA and in, 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 in Europe. Eh? We we typically use medicine residuals, uh, but but it's of course and uh, endocrine uh, disruptors, huh? which is a little bit more hormone uh, active agents. Eh? If, if, how I have it. Um, there is not really a set of defined regulations currently in the, in the US, eh? you, you, but you do expect uh, some new regulations that are pending, for example, looking for PFAS uh, as well. Correct. Um, yeah, we, we're anticipating PFAS to be uh, the initial the, the, or the, the soonest uh, uh, level of regulations given the intensity uh, and uh, the ubiquity in, in the environment. Uh, but we expect that pharmaceuticals and endocrine disruptors will probably follow suit. Uh, mm -hmm. I know they've been talking about it for the last 15 years intently. Um, but for PFAS, uh, those, uh, they've only really been talking about it the last five years. Uh, and they already have implemented a number of different uh, recommended uh, lim limits for drinking water uh, as a primary focus. Right. Uh, but then they're, uh, they are getting into... Uh, suggested limits, not necessarily actual uh, uh, required limits uh, for biosolids, but they are uh, they are rolling them out. Uh, in Massachusetts, they've also uh, added um, uh, MCP limits, uh, so mass contingency plan limits, uh, which is the amount allowed in soils, which is going to be directly translated to uh, biosolids and what you can apply to those soils. That, that is indeed also the, the big discussion I see here in the Netherlands. Eh? What, what do we do with the sludge uh, containing right. certain levels of, of PFAS? Yeah, it, it, and I'm sure it's very similar in the uh, European Union as well, is that uh, you, know, you can't just uh, suddenly stop beneficially using biosolids because there aren't enough landfills or incinerators around to actually handle the material. So you have to find other sustainable options on ways to deal with this uh, this um, uh, potential contaminant uh, and uh, and obviously the end product. So uh, you know there's there's been a lot of benefits by land application of biosolids, uh, both returning carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus back to the soils. Uh, so uh, what we we've been pushing as an industry is really uh, taking it out at the source. Uh, and eliminating it from uh, other di industrial or uh, residential discharges. Clear. And for, for your plant, for example, at Deer Island, you're mainly focusing on the sludge line and, and the biosolids that it goes well, out? We, we are. Well, we all obviously have to monitor the effluent as well. Um, the good news is, is we have uh, actually been uh, doing our own research over the past uh, two years, uh, monitoring uh, levels in both uh, uh, drinking water uh, wastewater effluent and uh, and also uh, the biosolids, uh, and we we feel fairly we're definitely very confident on the drinking water. We, we're not seeing any of our drinking water sources uh, that MWRA supplies. Uh, the wastewater uh, it really depends on what the levels are, but we're very close to the drinking water limit uh, for what we've seen in the results. Whether this is a good long term number, we'll have to figure it out. Uh, we have seen it in the biosolids. Um, uh, typically anywhere from 15 to 25 parts per billion, uh, obviously not the part per trillion level that, uh, they want on the drinking water, but then again, biosolids are also regulated at different levels. So the, uh, would the EPA be the first source to look for, you know, pending or discussions on, on pending regulations and, and norms for, uh, PFAS? Yeah, well, usually, usually the process is, uh, you know, the, the guidance comes from uh, the federal government with a lot of the research being done at the federal level uh, and then pushed down to the states. Um, that's been somewhat different uh, uh, for PFAS because the lack of information uh, uh, and the lack of research efforts. So uh, it's forced the states to do a lot of interim measures in between. Uh, the, you know, the federal government issued a uh, suggested limits for PFOA and PFOS. Uh, and, uh, and then the states have been running even further and uh, restricting that even further down. So I think the federal limit was around 70 parts per trillion. Uh, but I know in my state of Massachusetts, it's down to 20. All right, well, that's a, that's a, that's a difference already, yeah. Correct. Um, some on the, um, yeah, there's quite a few questions coming. I'll, I'll, I'll pick out um, the, 
Yeah, where you actually dose the iron for your true fight prevention. I thought that was an interesting question too. Uh, yeah, so we uh, we add iron uh, to the sludge going into the digesters. It, it helps uh, treat for hydrogen sulfide as well in the biogas. So it uh, reduces the amount of uh, hydrogen sulfide byproduct that might impact the uh, digester gas quality. Uh, so that's one benefit. So, um, and then uh, the iron actually reacts with the phosphorus, precipitates, precipitates it out as iron phosphate. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, then it's it's an inorganic compound that continues on with the biosolids, but technically is uh, separate from the biosolid. The uh, I'll touch a switch switch a little bit. So um, yeah, there's some questions on on, on digestate, uh, which which here in the Netherlands we're not allowed to use as a as a fertilizer. Uh, but you already touched base a little bit on the on the dynamics uh, with regard to biosolids. One interesting point, I think, on, on energy efficiency and optimization, uh, because you touched base on a few items. Uh, I know also from, from our exchange that uh, also in your pumping operations, hey, you do look at uh, energy optimization, for example, with the var variable frequency drives, uh, the shaft level adjustments, stuff like that. There's one question coming in from uh, somebody who's, yeah, uh, can offer also the machine learning capabilities to improve pump efficiency. And, and of course, for a large plant as yourself, uh, yeah, that, that also adds up, huh? because it's, it's the numbers. Yeah, I really didn't get into it, but we have one of the largest control systems in the country. We have about 35,000 input output points to our control system. And we have uh, an OSI Pi uh, data archive um, with machine learning off of the back end of that uh, to take advantage of ways to improve uh, monitoring and evaluation of the data that we produce to make it actually usable. Uh, you know, right. 35,000 points. Uh, that's an awful lot of points. You're not going to look at every single point every single day. Uh, but, um, you know, and especially when Deer Island only has about 250 employees dedicated to it with about 50 people associated with the laboratory. Uh, but uh, obviously you want to take advantage of your data systems to be able to flag that data and, and bring that information out. So, uh, yes, we do have, uh, we rely, it's not necessarily a, uh, a full AI uh, per se. Uh, but um, but OSI's uh, Pi system is a very strong uh, you know backbone to that. So I, I so I would encourage the SME to uh, to, to apply it because energy optimization mm -hmm. is a broad field. So also huh, uh, a predictive maintenance to optimize that energy consumption on that field. I, I would encourage them to to apply. And we do uh, have seventy thousand pieces of equipment on the island with a. Uh, <laughs> with a uh, maintenance management system as well uh, to manage all that equipment and asset management as well, so. Yeah, there's many aspects uh, that we touch, that you touch base, especially on today. I'll, um, I'll just quickly go through and pick uh, one, because I know you have to, to go later on to another meeting, Dave, so I'll, uh, I'll let you <laughs> I'll let you go. Uh, we're a little bit out of time, but I, I would like to use the, uh, the, uh, the hour if I can. Um, let me... Just going through, I see some answering and questions already here. What, what kind of technologies would you consider now for PFAS removal, Dave, just to go back to that a little bit? Uh, well, since the regulatory side of it isn't really there yet, um, right now we're focusing on monitoring. Uh, so we're looking, uh, we're actually investing in instrumentation and ways to improve uh, our uh, testing capabilities. Uh, and it'd be nice if eventually at some point we could also get an in situ type of uh, monitoring. That would be wonderful. Uh, right now, uh, because of the levels that we're talking about at part per trillion, uh, obviously uh, most of that is bench scale type of testing. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously for when you're getting down to part per trillion level, uh, everything associated with sampling around that type of uh, measurement is going to be critical because you can as I mentioned, PFAS is ubiquitous in the environment. It's basically in everything. Uh, you know, if, uh, if people go out uh, with improper equipment and they touch their, um, their waterproof coats and then touch the sample bottle, they're going to contaminate the sample. So uh, you know, uh, anything that would improve that process as well might be something that we're going to look at. So, so really, it's the sampling, the sampling and monitoring aspect of it more now rather than the treatment side of it, uh, because uh, until we really get information behind it, we don't know what, where, where we stand with that. I don't think we're gonna be ready to jump over to uh, 
treating our flow for PFAS uh, at this stage of the game, uh, just given the, the size of the plant, et cetera. But it might be forced upon us. We, we might never know, you never know until you see what the regulatory end of it is going to be. Yeah, I, yeah. I was more curious in the, what, what you would see as, as options, or, or, but I agreed. You mentioned before that this is not uh, this, at this stage also not 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 required, not and not necessary also from the uh, from the concentrations uh, perspective. Yeah. Right. Some treatment plants that have used uh, you know they've used activated carbon uh, right. as a way to uh, to filter. Um, and and then they have to deal with the activated carbon as a hazardous waste material afterward. Right, right, right. Yeah, I see. I think here in Europe we see a combination of adsorption, uh, AOP, uh, right. the, the type of, uh, of of technologies, and membrane technology also offers possibilities. Correct. Um, yeah, there's too many questions in the Q and A to answer all of them uh, today. Uh, Dave, we'll, we'll go through them and, and see if some and then sure. we share them with you and then try and see that we answer those uh, those posted. Um, I would like to thank you a lot for, for your time today. And, and You're welcome. Uh, we would like to get back to you. And I think I have to um, move on to Anna, otherwise she will, uh, yeah, uh, because we stay a little bit in time. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. And, uh, All right, you welcome. Yeah. Good luck. You continue, Anna, with uh, telling a little bit more about the EU Tech Bridge program. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you to the presenters. Um, so the... The key issue, do you have an innovation or a solution which matches the needs? Well, then you as an SME should apply. So uh, what are the next steps? Well, today is the day of the webinar. You've been presented the needs. We are recording uh, this uh, webinar so you can have a look at the presentations one more time. If you uh, want to proceed, you should apply. Deadline for applying is May 24th. Then there will be a selection process. First, the EU Tech Bridge partners will go through the applications, and then the end users will go through the applications to see which SMEs they would like to meet on one on one meetings. There will be virtual meetings. Then we'll do a follow up dialogue. And when the COVID 19 situation allows, will open up, open up for the physical meetings. So you'll receive information from EU TechBridge on how you apply via email. And remember, there is a grant possibility for the physical meetings. We would also like to encourage you to join our community, the Solved platform. Uh, here you will um, see the opportunities in North America. You will be able to engage with the companies and the organizations and other SMEs. And of course, hear about the upcoming activities. And remember, if you do have any questions, please contact your local partner. And we'll be very happy to take up a, a dialogue with you to see if your needs matches. And remember, it's always better to apply uh, and to see whether your idea, although not a perfect match, still is an interest of the end users. All right, Dehiro. So I think we'll uh, open up for uh, for the wrap up of this meeting. Yes, Anna. Um, I had a little bit of a look at. Timing. I propose that we, uh, we will not go any deeper within the heat. We did take uh, quite some good time, and we, we take up the rest of the question maybe in a, in a direct emailing between uh, Heat and, and and WRA with us. Um, so that that would leave me to thank very much uh, Dave West, uh, Zinat Magavi, and, and Audrey Schulman for presenting today to be part of the Technics webinar. We'll come back to you, of course. <laughs> Uh, be it with questions, be it with uh, with applications. Um, I see. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Zina. <laughs> thank you, Audrey. There's a question coming in, uh, Anna. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> There's a question coming in, Anna. Uh, could you explain a bit more how a selected process will be implemented and which conditions apply? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, well, we do uh, have a set base of questions that we will go through 
uh, how far along are your technology? How well does it match the needs? Uh, we would be happy to share the specific questions. Uh, there will be a, um, a template that you will uh, fill out with a bunch of questions just in order to, um, to select the, the correct SMEs. Um, and which conditions? Well, that you are an SME as defined by the European Commission. Uh, and uh, you will find that in the application form as well, which conditions applies to that. We uh, accept all SMEs from all of Europe to apply. Uh, however, not all European countries are accepted for grants. Grants are also defined upon uh, which grants have been given before. Okay, if, I add a little bit, if I may add, uh, Anna, yes. in, in, in general, we, we, we tend to uh, approve also within the selection process uh, where you as an SME gain points, the slightly higher TRL level uh, type of innovations uh, so in order to make sure that also yeah, expect expectations are met on the, on the American side, uh, so to speak. Huh? Uh, so uh, and it's, it's more proven type of technologies uh, that have been validated typically in, in, in Europe before they go across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, so to speak. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we do want to make sure that uh, you as an SME are ready for exports and can meet those expectations for, for international scale up if you haven't done that before. Uh, but then on the other hand, we're also uh, happy to, to assist you with the questions of doing exports and help you in the best way possible there. I see a question coming in, Anna, from uh, Silvia Porcel. Um, hello, I work for the Catalan Energy Cluster. I know a couple of members of the cluster who could have an innovation solution for those projects. Uh, I would like to know if, if it's possible to have a small summary of the two projects which have been exposed so I can send it to them. Thank you. Well, uh, there is a link to the innovation. If I may ask, uh, answer the question, uh, Anna, there's a link yes. on the EU TechBridge website, uh, uh, which uh, where the, the, the innovation needs are, are listed uh, and where you can um, also uh, connect and, and there will of course be uh, the email sent out uh, afterwards of the webinar on Yes, exactly. So I don't see a lot of other questions coming in. Let me check the chat. No, Haru, there are not any other questions. Neither Perfect. in the chat nor in the questions and answer. <laughs> then, uh, then I propose that we slowly close the, uh, the webinar for today. I want to thank everybody for participating on the American side and on the European side, all the EU TechBridge partners. Thank you, Salome, for doing the the most important backends and the, the technical issues. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Anna for me for co-moderating today. Um, wish you all a good day and please stay connected to your tech bridge. Keep following us and join us on next missions uh, in our journey across the US and Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye -bye.